Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, thank you all for coming to uh, so us today. Special gratitude to the uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Issa Jabbar Foundation for inviting me uh, to speak tonight. Um, the foundation has been contributing to, amongst other things, education uh, in and on uh, the Middle East, and as well as art projects. Um, and in all of that, I think they shine a light, a different light than usual, on the region. Um, and I'm very grateful and honored uh, that I'm invited to speak here today because I think the Abram Path too tries to do that in its own uh, special way, uh, shining a different light on uh, a region that is so often and so prominently in the news. So, now you've come to listen tonight to a Dutch Hungarian man speaking about walking in the East. I can imagine that sounds rather absurd if you think about it. Because the Dutch are famous for biking, and the Hungarians are famous for many things, uh, but at the moment not for many positive things, and uh, certainly not for walking. Uh, but that's a, probably a topic for a, a different lecture. Of course, the truly absurd notion is not Hungarian or Dutch, it is in combination of walking and the Middle East. Um, because is it not so that the Middle East presently is walking uh, towards us rather than vice versa? Uh, the dramatic influx of refugees through Turkey, Greece, the Balkans, and then into the EU, often on foot. Uh, they are fleeing a region with fragile states, civil war, religious extremism, terrorism, repression. Um, and if the Middle East is not literally walking into our backyard, then seems it is exporting its problems into our backyards. Um, the Paris attacks last Friday were the most recent example. Um, but the day before that, there was a big attack in Beirut. Um, obviously, everybody's heard about the tensions in Israel, Palestine. Uh, a Russian plane was bombed out of the air above Sinai. Um, and I can go on for a little bit. <coughs> then there is Jordan. It's little new. stable country in the Middle East which has more troublesome neighbors than Jordan. So in no place it seems more absurd to go for a walk and yet in no place it is more necessary and it is more fulfilling uh, and it is more hopeful in fact. So at least it can be and I hope that uh, this evening somehow in this lecture I can walk you around that strange paradox. To that end, perhaps it's useful if I tell you something about myself. First, I arrived in Jerusalem in 2006, working first for the European Union, and then for the Middle East Quartet, mostly on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But I had the fortune to be able to travel to a large variety of places, uh, across Israel, Gaza, across cities in the West Bank, Amman, Damascus, Beirut, and even Aleppo in Palmyra. Now, most diplomats that arrive in Jerusalem go through a sort of a routine cycle. First, there is naive enthusiasm, being deployed in a city that is at the heart, literally, of everything. The intractable Palestinian Israeli conflict, of course, but also the world media, they're all there. They never take that lens of the city, or the history, or religion, empire. And then there's a reasonable quality of living, it's reasonably safe, and there's beaches very nearby. So after that, enthusiasm is followed by disappointment. Disappointment of making any meaningful contribution to a non-existing peace process, to a two-state solution that seems to be a <coughs> solution every day, and then frustration over how terribly deadlocked the international system is uh, in dealing with a problem that is really the pinch nerve of, uh, of the world. Uh, after frustration comes anger. Anger at each and everybody involved, especially political leaders in the region and then also throughout the world. And then anger is followed by the penultimate stage of cynicism. Not caring anymore. And then the last stage is escape because diplomats have the fortune that they always go somewhere else. A new posting in another country, another city, 
usually after three or four years of enduring Jerusalem. Now, to many that live in Jerusalem temporarily, including in the luxury of diplomatic offices and homes, the city in all its aspects, its road signs, its traffic, its walls, its flags, its graffiti, its east-west division, its total presence of religion and its total absence of any spirituality. Uh, the city is a permanent pressure cooker. This is what everybody feels, at least those feel that live there temporarily. Uh, in everything one sees and reads the symbols of conflict. To give you one example, before I came to Jerusalem, I used to run for an hour and a half to clear my mind from work, energize my body, and leave my thoughts about work behind. And I actually still do that today. The only place that never worked for me was Jerusalem. Because around every corner, there's a new tyrant question. Is this east or west? Who does it belong to? Will people confuse me for the enemy? And why is nobody smiling? Now, I worked and lived in Jerusalem for six years, but contrary to the many others that I've just mentioned, I did not become cynical. And what saved me was a very simple thing. Uh, what saved me was walking. And with a small group of friends, every weekend I went out into the rural West Bank to wander around. Uh, it is an area small enough to get to know deeply if you spend the time, but large and diverse enough never to get bored. Uh, it knows some pretty tough hills. Uh, some examples you see on the pictures that I show, uh, up to about a 1,000 meter in elevation. Palestinians call them by the name of Jabal Mountain. Uh, but it also has more mellow pastures and valleys and spectacular gorges. Uh, and uh, empty yellow deserts, but also forgotten churches and makams which are holy shrines or hilltops observed by Muslims and other worshippers throughout many, many centuries. So on weekends, myself and a couple of friends started exploring places that were off the map for us, professionally at least. We were pretty naive about it. We had no guidebooks and we only had rudimentary maps. We had little knowledge of the villages we strolled into and out of. But it made for a true discovery each weekend. Not only discovery about Palestine, what it is, and what it could be, but also discovery about ourselves. Uh, of course, Palestine is not a Sweden. Literally, there is no walking around some of the manifestations of conflict, settlements, outposts, or distribution, Kafkaesque land division between area A, B, and C, the fence, the wall, the barrier, whatever you call it. Uh, and aside from the geopolitical symbols of conflict, Exploring an area without good maps and without good guidebooks can get you to places you would never encounter on a well manicured and tended walking trail. So, on the downside of these surprises, we found ourselves in artificial garbage dump sites, of up to our waist in the middle of impenetrable thistle fields. We also learned that it is not wise or comfortable to walk across the desert in the middle of June. <laughs> And the upside of the curve is much more, and is much, much more memorable. In over four years of walking, virtually every weekend, we found that the biggest surprise to us lay not in the difficult terrain, or in the amazing Byzantine monasteries hanging from cliffs, not in finding the remains of Ottoman railway stations, or seeing hundreds of stores migrate across the Great Rift Valley. Not in stumbling across villages whose layers of stones testify to the great empires that came, conquered, and eventually disappeared again. The biggest surprise for me and for the friends I walked with lay in the people that we met along the way. People on our walks were Palestinians and expats like myself, but especially the people we encountered while walking. All the farmers, car repairmen, shopkeepers, restaurant owners, students, bird watchers, family having a picnic. In a place that is so marred by conflict and occupation, what surprised me the most was how safe it felt, how safe we felt, and how welcome others made me feel. Others that I could only often uh, exchange basic Arabic pleasantries with. In the beginning, this was in 2008, 
I thought our growing group of walkers was the only walking group in the West Bank. I later found out that I was dead wrong. Palestinian groups from Ramallah and Birzeit have been going on walking expeditions for years, on which I'll tell you a bit more later. Now, fast forward, in 2012 I published a book, a book on the walks I had taken, which is called Walking Palestine. It was a project which eventually lured me to the Abram Path project, on which more shortly. Uh, the book, when it came out, received a lot of press attention. Uh, especially in Europe. But probably it did not receive a lot of press attention because the media expected it to become a work, you know, a global bestseller. Uh, or that the world would flock en masse to Palestine to walk. I think it received a lot of attention because it was a different story about Palestine and about Palestinians. A different narrative outside the usual binary victim or perpetrator story. And in no small way, I think that's what happens when you go out walking anywhere. Your binary way of thinking about the world gets lost, quite literally. And rather than reading a piece of my book, uh, let me read a piece of a writer far superior to myself. Uh, Pulitzer Prize winner Paul Salopak walked across the West Bank two years ago as part of his seven-year quest supported by National Geographic to walk around the world following the history of human migration venture which is called Out of Eden Project. I strongly recommend you check it out. Um, it is by any measure the most profound experiment on walking ever done. It is a lot more too. Um, there is no other project in the world that looks at the state of humanity today uh, in this profound way. Paul is walking from Africa through Asia to North and South America. He's writing stories about the people and themes he encounters, and using a methodology he has coined snow journalism. Paul started in Ethiopia early in 2013, and at the moment has walked over 2,800 miles, and he is at the moment crossing from Georgia to the remote Karakum Desert of Turkmenistan. I was fortunate enough to speak to him nearly a year into his walk when he had crossed Ethiopia and Djibouti and Saudi Arabia, and was in Jordan at that point, about to cross into the West Bank, uh, where he then walked walk a couple of sections on the, on the Abraham Path. So I would like to quote one piece of his dispatch on the West Bank, which he walked with a great Palestinian guide called Bassam. We depart from Jericho, among the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. We employ no cargo animals. West Bank is much too small to require mules. If we wished, we could walk across the region in a day. It is less than 20 miles wide at its narrowest point. But its size is deceptive. It will take us weeks to meander through the West Bank. Why? Because of its complexity. Because of its dense, compacted history. Because of its maze of frontiers, boundaries, micro-prisons, and no-go zones. Every few hours, sometimes every few minutes, Bassam steps across invisible lines that I cannot see. One kilometer, area A, Palestinian control. Another kilometer, area B, joint Israeli Palestinian control. The next kilometer, area C, full Israeli control. Then repeat and mix. Each zone imposes its own rules for land ownership, for civil rights, for freedom of movement. This cracked arrangement was conceived as a solution to, though it could be mistaken, from off the Israeli Palestinian conflict. The current political map of the West Bank, which looks like a cross section of a diseased brain, was drawn by the Oslo Peace Accords in 1993. As Israeli settlements multiply, the dividing lines grow more mottled and more intractable. Where are we now? I often ask Hassan. Area A, he will say, walking past the darkened casino in the outskirts of Jericho. Its lobby rings with silence. Its unused slot machine gathers dust in group shadows. A lost gamble after the violence of the Second Intifada. Or, area C, you will have, climbing up a rocky canyon called Wadi Kelt towards the Orthodox Christian Monastery. In fact, there are a few pictures of that monastery in, uh, in this um, uh, slideshow. Uh, a luxury of a fluent society, uh, sorry, an Orthodox Christian monastery. For the first time in a year of walking, I spot trail markers. 
luxury of fluent societies. A startling transition to order. It's where the organization has painted them on stone. End of quote. Paul then continued to walk all the way to Geneva via Nazareth to Haifa, where he departed to Western Turkey. I strongly recommend all of his dispatches. And there's many, many to read, but they're all insightful, beautiful, and sometimes shocking, but very inspiring. If you walk, your mind opens up. It wanders about, new thoughts occur. Your mind may ponder on bad stuff as much as on good. But by walking, you postpone strong judgments on either. There is no compulsion for instant clarity or instant action. So contrary to the ultra speed of everyday life, it is okay not to react not to decide, not to take action, not to resolve, and most importantly, not to judge. The mind works at its millennia old steady pace of about three miles per hour, slow and considerate, roaming the entire world, even if the walk is just in your own backyard. I sometimes think that walking in the Middle East is in some sense the ultimate proof that regardless of where one is, however daunting the prospect of walking, chemistry between feet and brain is actually universal, and it works everywhere. And there's probably no better place to illustrate that than in the Middle East. British authors like Robert McFarlane, Americans like Rebecca Solney and Wayne Curtis, and French like Frederick Gross illustrate this beautifully in a range of books that have come out in the last five to ten years. Um, but walking is no Western invention or phenomenon. Palestinian author Raja Shahada has written extensively on walking. And up to a century ago, walking, in any case, was the prime means of transport everywhere. But also, the prime and silent means behind works of art and philosophy. For example, Rousseau, Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, Kant, Thoreau, Wordsworth, they were all addicted, compulsive walkers. So interestingly, for the English language, but that pointed out being here today in London, one has many, many verbs for describing the act of walking in many, many different ways. One of them, at least according to David Henry Thoreau, uh, is very, very closely affiliated with the Middle East. In his essay, Walking, Thoreau writes the following. I have met with but one or two persons in the course of my life who understood the art of walking, that is, of taking walks, who had a genius, so to speak, for sauntering, which word is beautifully derived from idle people who roved about the country in the Middle Ages and asked charity on the pretense of going à la Sainte Terre, to the Holy Land, till the children exclaimed, there goes a Sainte a saunterer, a holy lander, they who never go to the Holy Land in their walks, as they pretend, are indeed mere idlers and vagabonds. But they who do go are saunterers in a good sense, such as I mean. Some, however, who derive the word from santé, without a land or without a home, which therefore in a good sense will mean having no particular home, but equally at home everywhere. For this is the secret of successful sauntering, he who sits still in a house all the time may be the greatest vagrant of all. But the saunterer, in a good sense, is no more vagrant than the meandering river, which is all the while uh, sedulously seeking the shortest course to the sea. But I prefer the first, which is indeed the most probable derivation. Now, that's a lot of meandering and walking. So, and the lot of meandering, perhaps a little bit about my um, but after that, Yamri, let's now talk about the idea for the Abraham Path, which is a cultural walking route across the Middle East. Uh, 2003 was the year of the invasion of Iraq, amongst others, less than two years after 9 11. And in the midst of that debate, as many of you will remember, uh, there was Huntington's clash of civilization appearing everywhere. 2003 is history in the making still. A lot of the crises we see in the region today relate directly back to that fateful invasion and its direct aftermath. There is now a lot of people oppose the idea 
that it is somewhat the destiny of civilizations, or East and West, to clash with one another, that they are bound to be at war with one another. In that year, 2003, the idea of the Abraham path was born. Initially conceived by negotiation expert William Urey, who is still uh, very much behind the initiative today, um, but then cultivated for a while at the Harvard Program of Negotiation, and eventually, in 2006, tested in the Middle East, and supported by a wide range of individuals, both from the Middle East and from the rest of the world. In its essence, the idea for the Abram Path is an antidote to fear, ignorance, and separation. The vicious cycle so often observed inside the Middle East, but also between the East and the West. We see it again and again also in the aftermath of Paris last week. Fear of the other, ignorance about the other, and an intuitive reaction to separate oneself from the other. Build higher walls and fences, up the military game, even if all evidence suggests that the extremists are amongst us, they are our citizens. And even if all evidence suggests that the others are mostly fellow victims. Now the Abram path, to, write, to, put my, to put the project right down where it belongs, has no single silver bullet solution to all these huge geopolitical crises in the Middle East. But it does carry a very important message. And it is a life experiment in many ways of what happens if we literally walk to the other and gradually put ourselves in someone else's shoes. The antidote to fear, ignorance, and separation consists of three actions that reinforce one another. Story, walk, and hospitality. Each of them are characteristics of Abraham and the journey that he made about 4,000 years ago. Let me start with story. The story of Abraham is the origin story to which over half of humanity relates in some kind of way. Through their faith, their culture, their customs, and their traditions. Abraham is the father of the three monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. There are plenty of differences on the story between and inside these religions, and I will not delve deeply into them today, but there is more than enough that connects them to the figure and the story of Abraham and what he Hospitality is one such central value in the story. Abraham is the father of hospitality, of inviting the stranger into one's home or tent providing nourishment and protection to travelers, not only to one's own kin, but especially to those who are different, including those who may worship differently or who may worship not at all. The memory of Abraham goes beyond religious scripture, and it manifests itself in customs and heritage and oral stories all across the region. Then the third concept, walk. In many ways, Abraham was the word the world's first interpret traveler. If you will, he was the first backpacker ever. He was ready to leave all certainty behind and walk from Haram all the way across what we today call the Middle East and into the unknown. This, I feel, is still what is happening today when you take any walk in the Middle East. So what the Abraham Pop does is to celebrate the cultural memory of Abraham, but more widely the people in the Middle East in a wide sense. It's a path that connects East and West by showing travelers, hosts, and guides the other face, or the face of the other. A path of dignity, a time when raging conflicts and stereotypes deeply hurt the dignity of individuals, of communities, and of nations. Now, that all sounds very beautiful, but the question, of course, you may all have is, is anything of it real? Is the idea of a cultural route across the Middle East around story, walk, and hospitality uh, in any way uh, uh, actually real to people on the ground and to travelers? Now, when I wrote Walking Palestine, most people thought that walking across the West Bank was a very, very silly idea. It wasn't, and the proof was out there every weekend with a wide range of local walking groups and a number of foreign walking groups going out to walk and enjoy the other face of Palestine. The same is now true for the Abram Path. People are walking a variety of local trails that make up the path every week and at times every day. True, 
foreign tourism to the Middle East generally and the niche of progressive adventure-based community tourism uh, is no exception, it is on the decline at the moment because of everything that happened over the past year and a half. The rise of ISIS and other older conflict have dealt a pretty heavy blow, especially since the summer of 2014. And yet, I'm very optimistic, especially because there is a local walking, hiking revolution going on right at this moment in places that have, in the past, not seen anything like it, like Jordan, Egypt, and Palestine. In Palestine, in particular, the Masar Ibrahim al Khalil, al Khalil meaning the friend in Arabic, and referring to Khalil or Hebron, which is the burial place of Abraham. The Masar Ibrahim al Khalil has developed from a short five day walking route, which it was in 2012, to a fully continuous north to south walking route of over 320 kilometers and two dozen communities. The path is mostly walked by local Palestinians and expats living in the region. In Jordan, the Jordan Trail is being developed at the moment, which is over 600 kilometers of walking, connecting the country's most prestigious heritage and natural sites, such as Petra, Wadi Rum, Karak, Mount Nebo. Here too, Jordanians are not only the prime force behind developing the trail, they're also the largest group walking from village to village. In Egypt, there's the Sinai Trail, which starts at the coast and climbs all the way up to Mount Sinai and Mount Catherine, and it has made major progress just in the last 12 months. Here too, Egyptian hikers, not foreigners, have been leading the way. Israel has for decades known a culture of trail making and walking, but it is changing character over the last few years, moving from an approach that emphasizes wilderness and the outdoors alone to a combination of both nature and culture. The Negev Highlands Trail is such an example, which is on the Amber Park as well, uh, where Bedouin communities that are normally at the margins of society in Israel are deliberately integrated into this country. Now, the Amber Park project invests in many of these different <coughs> local movements. It trains new trekking guides, it sponsors community outreach, and it develops the online and offline resources that travelers need, whether they are local or foreign. The results are today, just to summarize that for you, over 2,000 kilometers of walking trail developed in five countries, crossing 151 communities. Over 5,000 walkers to date. True, none of them have walked at all. But that too is about to change. Uh, Neil McCarran and Dave Cornbreath are two British adventure filmmakers, and they will soon, in fact, in exactly 10 days, start their epic journey called Walk the Masai. Although these days I should probably call it hashtag Walk the Masai. It's probably the official <laughs> uh, That's a foot journey which will circumvent literally the heart of the Middle East on the Amber Path. And what I'm curious and excited about is that they will use the through hike as an educational platform. They will engage schools in the Gulf, the UK, Ireland, Switzerland, and Canada as they are walking across the region. There's probably no better way to deeply involve the global community in shining a different light on the other face of the Middle East and the face of the other as these type of journeys do. Now, I'm of course terribly biased here because I lead the Amber Path project. And I'm totally addicted to, addicted to walking in the Middle East. So don't believe me for it. Uh, the best thing is to ask people from the region that are involved. Uh, for The Guardian, Kevin Rushby wrote a piece on Masal Ibrahim a while ago, and it is worth quoting the part of it, which I'll do now. That evening, we stayed in Nawata, a village near Nablus where the children sang about red tomatoes. There were tales of horror and violence too. There is no escaping the bloody history in this land, but it never became overwhelming, as I had expected. Hassan, our host, was keen to enthuse about the Masai. He said, it was like a light coming on here. We got connected to the outside world, and that makes us feel hopeful. Everyone in the village is always asking about when the next walkers are coming. Our third day took us further south near the springs of Ain San, now a water source for Jerusalem. We spotted chameleons in the bushes, 
whistling rock hyraxes and huge flightless crickets, then clambered up a delightful gorge, taking narrow shepherd's trail along the cliff face. By evening, we approached the village of Kufremad, a place that was to hold perhaps the biggest surprise. The first came at a huge hacienda-style house where the whole family came out to invite us for coffee. Do you speak Spanish? asked the husband. I learned it in Colombia. Kufremalik bizarrely is a little enclave in Latin America. It does. When we found our host for the night, the old man of the family, Hosni Alcock, explained, in the 30s, when times were hard here, my uncle decided to seek his fortune in America. He ended up selling shirts in Colombia, then got a shop, then got a supermarket. He became very rich. Osni smiled ruefully. My father, on the other hand, stayed behind and was killed in the first intifada. And did other men go? Oh yes, lots and lots, and they spread out into other countries. There are now more than 800 descendants of this village in Brazil alone. The effect of this exposure to the outside world of Kufra Malik has been electrifying. The men are hardworking and ambitious. The women assertive and independent minded. Hiba, our hostess, had been to the Côte d'Azur to see what it was like. We camped on the beach in Nice, she said very proud. It was So was her cooking. Roast chicken, rice, vegetables, and moussaka. Flat bread cooked with sumac and onion. What would you do if a Jewish person came to stay? I asked. No problem, they all said eagerly. We've had one Jewish lady from America already and another from Brazil. Everyone is welcome here. End of quote. Maybe I put one more quote, a very short one, from a host that I met on uh, one of my last trips. His name is Ayat Mardawi and is a mother of six who turned her home state into a guest house on Facebook. Something we've seen happening more and more also in Jordan. She said, this project really opened a lot of relationships for me. People from all over the West Bank. Masar Ibrahim changed a lot in my life. Last year, the Abraham Park project received a big boost in terms of publicity. National Geographic Traveler declared it the number one best new long distance walking trail in the world. The author of the article, Ben Lerwill, wrote this. This sense of immersion is what makes the Abram Path project so extraordinary. It gives travelers the chance to sharpen their own perspective, or to sort of shape their own perspective. The National Geographic piece was a big honor for us, of course. And it was also a big surprise. Perhaps it was premature, as it appeared in the midst of a project that is still developing the path in actual fact. The work is still ongoing. Day. But it gave us and our partners a very big boost of confidence that we are perhaps the crazy ones, the misfits, folks swimming against the geopolitical tide in the Middle East. Um, but that little could be more meaningful for us to do than exactly this time. So I want to end uh, my talk by showing you a three minute video. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. Want to exist today? I have a YouTube channel. So we also have one. Uh, and there's about a dozen videos on the path. Some of them geographically. So if you're interested in the region, you can just see that region. And some of them thematically. Uh, this is sort of a thematic video uh, with mostly Palestinian content, but it gives a very good uh, overview. It's also a video uh, that uh, was produced uh, because. Having a YouTube channel is not enough. Today, you also have to do crowdfunding. And we are doing crowdfunding. So we started our first crowdfunding campaign with this video as its main, main, main input. Um, and it is running out in about three days. So if you are inspired by this lecture, which was already free, uh, then I hope you consider making a donation. And I hope you consider also sharing it with your friends network on Facebook and who knows what. Um, I will try to start the video. It hasn't disappeared. It's only a few minutes, so
streaming into the heart of the Middle East. To develop a long distance walking train, following the footsteps of Abraham, the legendary ancestor known for his hospitality and kindness to strangers. Thanks to the generous support of donors around the world, like you, the Abraham Path Initiative has worked with local communities to develop the route section by section. Today, the path stretches between traditional locations of the birthplace and tomb of Abraham and connects to other sites of Abrahamic history and memory. The path is a place of meeting and connection between people, a place of sustainable tourism, and it is also a powerful catalyst for socio-economic development. But we need your help to reach our full potential. So far, we've worked with our partners to develop over a thousand kilometers of trail to more than 100 communities across 15 regions. All along the way, walkers find welcome in hundreds of communities, where local people are in the guides, hosts, and chefs. Manal hosts walkers overnight in many Nain Mirhi. She's one of many women at the fore of a new social entrepreneurship growing on traditional hospitality. Yes, please. 